God, dude. Chased from their homes by fast-moving flames. Good evening, I'm Wendy Mesley, and this is The National. More than 200 wildfires are now burning in BC. So we all have to go run fast, get out of there. More help is on the way. In Quebec, a dramatic rescue at a suspicious seniors' home fire. Donald Trump says he wants to battle cybersecurity by teaming up with Russia. Yep, the country accused of hacking the U.S. election. And does Omar Khadr deserve a $10 million settlement? British Columbia is on high alert tonight as a growing number of wildfires rage across the province. Thousands of people have already been forced from their homes, while many more await word to pack up and leave at a moment's notice. This is the current situation. 220 active fires are burning across the province. That's about 50 more than yesterday. Many are out of control with no relief in sight. Today, though, provincial and federal officials announced more help is on the way. Anita Bath starts our coverage tonight. Windy conditions mean little progress, if any, has been made in fighting the growing number of wildfires. The situation is likely to get worse with the hot and dry weather. The uh, wildfire service crews uh, uh, with helicopters and bombers uh, bombing the west side of the river to uh, to keep the fire from spreading across the river and also to save one of the houses across uh, the river here in the reserve. Esther's spy lived at the Ashcroft Indian Reserve. I just had to go really fast to get away from my house because um, it was coming up the valley, up the gully or whatever. And uh, it's just, we all had to go run fast, get out of there. Spy had to flee her home without her cat socks. He wouldn't come out. I couldn't get him. He was scared, and I don't know if he's alive or anything. I don't know where he is. In Williams Lake, the situation is dire, with more evacuations, and now reports of looting from people's abandoned homes. They took meat out of our freezer. They took our, I believe it's 42-inch uh, flat-screen TV out of the living room. They took the portable DVD player, this. They took my husband's shotguns. I thought, how can you do that to somebody that's already going through such stress, tra traumatic, you know, right now, and then come and take them when they're most vulnerable and take their stuff? Like, we're going through enough. Christy Clark is the Premier until... Today, Premier-designate John Horgan toured some of the worst-hit areas. Outgoing Premier Christy Clark is making $100 million available to the Red Cross, as well as $600 immediately for each registered evacuee. We are going to be, I think, deploying um, Canadian Armed Forces uh, to support us in any evacuations, should it be required. So they are standing ready to, or standing ready to, to jump to jump in if we need them. Firefighters are on their way from other provinces to relieve some of the exhausted crew members working around the clock. The sense is, though, this fight is nowhere near over. Anita Bath, CBC News, Kamloops. To get a sense of what firefighters are up against, I spoke to BC's Chief Fire Information Officer earlier tonight. Kevin Skrepnik is in Kamloops. So, Kevin, just trying to get a sense of how potentially horrific this is. Canadians are so familiar with those fires in Fort McMurray. Is, is, is there anything that, that could equal that kind of horror? What we're seeing isn't quite yet at the level of Fort McMurray in, in terms of the size and, and the populations we're talking about, but given the amount of fire we have on the landscape right now and given the fact that we're not seeing any reprieve in terms of the weather, certainly for the next three to five days, uh, there's certainly potential out there for this to get quite a bit worse. Uh, having said that, I certainly don't want to speculate based on anything uh, that's happened in the past and we're doing everything we can to uh, protect these communities, uh, keep highways and transportation routes open and, and try to keep people abreast of what's going on. What is the scariest thing? Is it the weather? 
The weather has really been uh, the driving force here, Wendy. Uh, we've had two to three weeks of really hot and dry conditions, unseasonably warm here in BC. That's really set the stage for where we're at today. And of course, that all was kicked off Friday when we had a, a really intense weather system come through, thousands of uh, strikes of dry lightning across the central part of the province. And that's really uh, what set the stage for where we're at today. You know, almost a dozen major interface fires burning right now across the province. Uh, entire communities that have had to have been evacuated, lots of highways affected. Uh, and as I said, uh, unfortunately, uh, it looks like from a weather perspective, we're in for more of the same for, uh, for the foreseeable future. So I know the fires aren't under control, but is the firefighting effort what you would hope it would be? Given this, this level of activity, uh, if, this, if this tempo is going to continue, uh, it is going to start to stretch our resources. So we're already looking ahead, uh, not just two to three days ahead, but, you know, one to two weeks in terms of how long this, uh, this level of, of fire could continue. Uh, so we are bringing in resources from out of province. Uh, we're reaching out to our partner agencies across Canada uh, in the neighborhood of 300 personnel starting to arrive uh, Monday and Tuesday. We're reaching out to the forest industry here in BC. They've got a lot of uh, trained crews uh, in firefighting. We're moving our own resources around as well. Uh, to uh, priority areas of the province to, to make sure that we've got uh, as many resources where they can do the most good. Uh, further to that, bringing in more aircraft, more equipment as well, uh, really so we can bring as many resources to bear in, in terms of addressing the situation. Kevin Skrepnik, thanks so much for this and good luck to you all. Oh, thank you, my pleasure. And tonight, the federal government has announced that it will send in the military to help. The Minister of National Defence has deployed two planes, five helicopters and personnel to support crews fighting the fires. Several people who fled the fires have already received word their properties have been destroyed, including Susan Smith, who lived in the Boston Flats trailer park. She and her husband are now staying with friends in Kamloops. We lost everything and... So did everybody else in the trailer park, like all the trailers and every, everything are just laying flat. We probably won't even be able to save a picture. Uh, we never thought that it would get to our trailer park. You know, you're, you're like, oh, this won't happen to me. But guess what it did? And there's so many of us, not just Gary and I, there's what, 40, 50, 50 homes or something like that in the, in the trailer park. And everybody's out now, you know, like the whole trailer park is gone. Susan Smith. One last note to give you an idea of the size of some of these fires. If you were to add up the six largest fires, they would cover a combined area of about 15,000 hectares or 150 square kilometers. That's the equivalent of approximately 37 Stanley Parks. To other news now, there was a dramatic rescue operation in suburban Montreal this morning after a huge fire ripped through a senior's home. Dozens of residents were pulled to safety, but one person has now died. And as Matt Demore reports, police are investigating whether the fire was deliberately set. Neighbors were startled awake by this, a fire raging through the Oasis Seniors residence. Firefighters worked through the night, rescuing residents and trying to get the flames under control. Neighbor Mario Berube says he helped a woman get out. So we came outside, my son called uh, 911 right away. Then uh, he came and helped uh, take, uh, getting some people out. And uh, I'm telling you, it started in a basement. Within two minutes, the flames were right up to the roof. Eyewitnesses say that a man on the top floor of the residence was screaming out of his window for help, but firefighters hadn't yet arrived on the scene and there were no ladders to get to him. That's why police pushed this trampoline from a nearby yard over the fence and placed it under the window, telling the man to jump out. But he said he couldn't because he was paralyzed. Firefighters arrived minutes later and were able to rescue the man with a ladder. Police say 45 people were rescued. 11 people were rushed to hospital. Three had serious injuries, including a 94-year-old woman with serious burns who later died. And what's even more shocking, this may not have been an accident. Some suspicious elements were found, but I will not be able to give you more details about 
what kind of suspicious uh, component because the investigation is uh, young. This morning, this was what was left of the building. Charred wood, twisted metal, and a caved-in roof. A provincial official says sprinklers were being installed in the residence, but she doesn't know if they went off. She did say the system was scheduled to be tested in the coming days. Matt Damour, CBC News, Terrebonne. Coming up... Iraq declares a major victory against ISIS. But is this what winning looks like? Plus, denounced in the House of Commons, then later given the Order of Canada. What a great country, huh? We chat with the man behind Aislinn, Terry Mosher. For some watching the G20, Donald Trump's meeting with Russia's Vladimir Putin was judged heavy on cooperation and too light on confrontation. Today, Trump made it clear he sees things differently, that it's time to, quote, move forward. In Washington tonight, amid a new twist in the scandal over his campaign's alleged links to Russia, he's only raised more questions. Evan Dyer has more. President Trump gave himself great reviews for his performance in Hamburg. The White House today released a video that showed the president surrounded by admiring foreign leaders, and Donald Trump tweeted it out. But it was his proposal to set up a cyber security unit with Russia, the very country American intelligence agencies see as the main threat to U.S. cybersecurity that drew the strongest reactions, including from his own party. Senator Marco Rubio wrote that partnering with Putin on a cyber security unit is akin to partnering with Syrian President Assad on a chemical weapons unit. The more you do this, the more people are suspicious about you and Russia. The proposal seemed to cement a view even among some Republicans that it was Putin who emerged victorious from the long-awaited sit-down, just as many here had warned would happen. Former uh, Defense Secretary uh, Ash Carter said I, Trump had been played. But this is like the guy who robbed your house proposing a working group on burglary. It's they who did this. The proposal seems certain to anger U.S. intelligence agencies who have no desire to share sensitive information with their Russian counterparts in any kind of joint unit. He's kind of throwing them under the bus. Uh, so if you're in the FBI, the CIA, uh, if, you're, if you're part of the intelligence community superstructure in the United States, uh, th this is setting up a, an incredible tension that I can't recall uh, any modern U.S. president having. Former CIA director John Brennan even used the word treason. The process of committing treason against one's country frequently takes place in an unwitting fashion in the early stages. This all came as the New York Times revealed new details about a meeting held last year between Donald Trump Jr., Trump's son-in-law Jared Kushner, Trump's campaign chair Paul Manafort, and a Kremlin-connected Russian lawyer. Donald Trump Jr. said today that Russian lawyer had promised damaging information about Hillary Clinton, but it all came to nothing. As for the president himself, Trump's lawyers deny he ever knew about the meeting. Evan Dyer, CBC News, Washington. Tonight, Donald Trump appeared to backtrack on the notion of a joint cybersecurity unit with Russia. He tweeted, quote, The fact that President Putin and I discussed a cybersecurity unit doesn't mean I think it can happen. It can't. But a ceasefire can and did. Apparently, he was referring to the ceasefire deal agreed with Russia in southwestern Syria. Whatever cooperation Trump thinks he can get in other areas on Russia's involvement in Ukraine, the Trump administration seems intent on standing firm, something the U.S. Secretary of State Rex Tillerson underlined today in Kiev. It is necessary for Russia to take the first steps to de-escalate the situation in the east part of Ukraine. Tillerson said that sanctions against Russia for its invasion of Crimea and activities in eastern Ukraine won't be lifted until Russia withdraws. Ukraine's president called Tillerson's trip to Kiev a, quote, clear show of support. Tillerson didn't stop there. He flew on to Istanbul to meet with Turkey's foreign minister and reassure that ally. Turkey is furious over U.S. reliance on Kurdish forces to fight ISIS in Syria. Ankara says those forces have links to terrorist groups inside Turkey. Istanbul also hosted a massive protest rally, demonstrating against the Turkish government's arrest of tens of thousands after last year's failed coup. The protest was the culmination of an opposition party's 450-kilometer march from Ankara to Istanbul. 
Organizers say more than a million people showed up to the rally. The grueling campaign to liberate Mosul from ISIS has taken more time and taken more lives than many anticipated. But today, Iraq's Prime Minister thanked his troops in person for their victory, a sign the fight against ISIS has moved into a new phase. Rebecca Collard has the story. This is the Iraqi forces' victory march. Hoisting guns and flags, they parade through the streets of Mosul. The Iraqi Prime Minister arrived in Mosul today to congratulate his forces on liberating the city from ISIS. But there is still fighting in Mosul. ISIS forces are still holed up inside the old city and are putting up fierce resistance in the few streets they still control. It took ISIS just days to take Mosul in June of 2014, but it has taken more than eight months of hard fighting for Iraqi forces to take the city back. ISIS deploys snipers on the roofs and the buildings, and the planes detect them and target them, he says. ISIS is to blame for the destruction and damage in the city. Mosul is in ruins. Some neighborhoods are completely destroyed. More than 900,000 people have been displaced by the fighting, and it's unlikely many will be returning home anytime soon. The Iraqi government is celebrating taking back the country's second largest city from ISIS. But the battle against the militants isn't over. ISIS still controls territory south and west of Mosul. And they are likely to put up more tough resistance as Iraqi forces advance. What this is the end of is, you know, the so-called Islamic State, the caliphate building project, their attempt to kind of create a state. It's certainly the end of that. But is this the end of ISIS? No. Uh, the organization will continue to exist. It's changed its strategy. It's changed its structures. Meaning that ISIS can return to its roots as a guerrilla insurgency. The region has many more hard months or even years ahead. Rebecca Collard, CBC News, Erbil, Northern Iraq. Straight ahead on the Sunday Talk, the $10 million payout that's provoking strong reactions across the country. And this is something else that's in use now and will one day be a part of every home. It's called the video phone. It's very simple to use. Pick up the dial, punch the buttons, and I just press a button, and here I see Lloyd. Hi. Hi, Sandy. And how are you? I'm fine, thank you. I can't see you yet. You can't see me? No. You can just punch up a button. There. Oh, there you are. See, there I'm right are. in front of the lens. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. Very good, but I can control this. If I'm off-center, you can't see me anymore, so... Uh, You'd only want to do that if uh, you weren't properly dressed, though, wouldn't you? Right, so there'll be uh, no peeking at ladies when they're dripping wet and fresh from the tub. Hey, what's going on here? Hey, oh, what's your name? What are you doing? Je m'appelle Guillaume Lieberman, et je prends le français. Oh, he says he's Willy Lieberman, and he's uh, learning how to speak French. Well, tell me how this little machine works, Willy. Well, this is a teaching machine, and it's very simple. Even an adult could use it. You see, in this box on magnetic tapes are 22 15-minute French lessons. Mm -hmm. So say I want lesson number five. I turn the dial and pull the switch. Yes. Now, after each phrase in French, there's a pause. So if I want, I can repeat the phrase into this microphone right here. Mm -hmm. And it will be recorded on another channel. Mm -hmm. Later, I can turn back and hear both myself and the teacher, and I can check my pronunciation. That's great. I say, uh, Willie, how would you like to have a nice, juicy hot dog? Oh, oui, monsieur. Oui, bon, très bien. Uh, Sandy, can we use your oven? Oh, viens, on va manger quelque chose de bon, viens. 
Okay. Lloyd Willie's machine is not experimental. It's actually being used in schools today. Well, now here, Sandy, I see a very old and a very beautiful painting. It looks great, but I don't quite to see the point. What's this got to do with the future? Well, it is very beautiful, I agree, and, it, and it's real. It was painted by Albert Kuyp, and it was painted in the 17th century and now hangs in the art gallery in Toronto. It's worth about $20,000. You see, some things won't change. Ovens and telephones and teaching aids may get newer and more progressive. But this painting represents something which is very dear to us. And that something, in a word, is art. Sometimes I think how lucky I would be to have a me as a my father. I would look up at the me and say, Thank you, me, for allowing me to become such a great you. Time now for the Sunday Talk, where we tap into the debate of the week. Does Omar Khadr deserve a $10.5 million settlement? Born in Canada, Omar Khadr's childhood was steeped in Al-Qaeda ideology. His father, a friend of Osama bin Laden, took him to Afghanistan to fight. When the U.S. invaded after 9-11, 15-year-old Khadr was shot and captured, accused of throwing a grenade that killed American soldier Christopher Spears. He became the youngest detainee at the notorious U.S. prison in Guantanamo. He was subjected to sleep deprivation and denied legal counsel. He was a victim. He wasn't a mastermind and a perpetrator of anything. The Canadian Supreme Court ruled Cotter's human rights were violated and that Canada shared the blame. After he pled guilty to war crimes, Cotter was allowed to serve the rest of his time in Canada, but later recanted his confession, saying he'd been under duress. He sued the Canadian government for $20 million. All along, Cotter's been a polarizing figure. Omar Cotter is a well-known supporter of the Al-Qaeda terrorist network and a convicted terrorist. Conservatives tried to keep him behind bars, but an Alberta court released him on bail. The Liberal government has now settled the case, paying him $10.5 million. A Canadian citizen's charter rights were violated. As a result, the Government of Canada was required to provide a remedy. This payout is a slap in the face to the men and women in uniform who face incredible danger every day to keep us safe. I'm joined now by our panelists. Supriya Devetti is a talk radio host in Toronto. Jonathan Kay is an author and freelance columnist. And Tasha Carradine is a talk radio host and columnist with iPolitics. So, this is really divided. The media, it's divided. Uh, Canadians in general, certainly the political parties. What do you think, Tasha? Was that settlement right or wrong? I think it was wrong. I think that, uh, as you said, the, there was a violation of Wilmer Carter's rights that was found by the Supreme Court. Does that entitle him to $10.5 million? I think that is what question to look at here. There was no monetary amount attached to the Supreme Court's decision. It was not in a civil proceeding. The government is not letting a civil proceeding play out here. They are saying, well, we figure we would lose, uh, so let's let's cut our losses, essentially. We don't know what the court would have found. And we also don't know, in this case, um, you know, what is going to happen to Omar Khadr's claim in the United States that his conviction should be overturned, that he did save us under duress. The court has not ruled on that either. So with all these legal things hanging, I think it's immensely hypocritical for this government that is pursuing other cases you know, for veterans' pensions, for example, that is not paying out additional sums to First Nations children who were found to have their human rights violated by, by the courts as well, to suddenly capitulate in this case. What do you think, Sakria? So I do agree with Tasha that it does seem that the Liberal government is picking and choosing which which uh, which cases they're going to settle out of court in and which ones that they're going to proceed all the way. But I, I disagree in terms of that this is very much, ooh, we don't know what would have happened. We have, you know, now a bunch of rulings by the Supreme Court that say that his rights were violated. We do know that the Charter does apply to Canadians, irrespective of where, what territory you find yourself on. As a, can a Canadian is a Canadian is a Canadian. And even though morally uh, and politically Politically, we may not like the judgment. Legally, I think that it's sound. What do you think, John? I mean, I guess there's a legal argument. There's also, does he deserve it? He was the arguments made. He's a child soldier. 
Yeah, and by the way, most forms of litigation end in some kind of settlement or plea bargain. It's, it's, it's hardly unusual that this would be settled before the, the, the case goes uh, to its full length. Uh, from a moral point of view, I do think he, he does deserve it. He was a 15-year-old uh, child, as was mentioned in the setup package. He was uh, the youngest uh, detainee at Guantanamo. And it was you'd have to go back to the Second World War to find an instance in which someone that young was treated uh, the way Omar Khadr was treated. It was it's, uh, completely uh, unusual, even given the lack of due process that took place at Guantanamo and in Afghanistan during that period. This stood out as a particularly egregious example, violating the rights of someone who was a child and who was programmed from youth to be a terrorist. I don't think he had the same moral responsibility for his actions that someone like his dad did, or like the other detainees at Guantanamo. Well, you wrote a piece this week suggesting that he was scapegoated. I mean, what well, do you think beyond the legal yeah. arguments here? I mean, it does seem that uh, Cotter is becoming the lightning post for a lot of the frustration uh, that's felt by the right in terms of how this government has handled, you know, a bunch of issues. Um, and I, I think they are scapegoating him. And I think that they're, in some cases, uh, w willingly misleading the public, even in terms of having Peter McKay, who is the former attorney general. He should know full well that the charter does apply to Canadians, uh, whether or not you're found in Canada or not. And yet you hear him g spewing out those talking points. I would say Aaron O'Toole also is another Conservative MP who has gone out there and on murky water, who by himself is also a lawyer, so he should know better. And that's what I find very troubling about this, that well, this isn't just feelings. This is actually, this is the law. Well, the charter does apply. I, I wouldn't go as far as some of the uh, politicians who are saying that it's just, just a moral outrage and that is the reason that we should just ignore the charter. I think the charter does apply. It does. But the, the issue is, like I said, there's the issue of the quantum. There's the issue also of the fact that Cotter himself, um, now, with this money, Half of it's gone to the lawyers, probably. Uh, we say he, apparently he has split the money with his lawyers. That is the reports that are out there. Um, a lot of people are questioning the motivations as well here. Uh, he's going to be benefiting from a sum of money. We don't know what's going to happen to that money as well. Is it going to go to help defend his sister, Zainab, who is in uh, custody um, for allegedly terrorist-related activities as well? I think that's one of the issues. In Turkey. That, in Turkey, exactly. And a lot of people, I think because of his family connections, I hear you that he was programmed as, from a childhood. He had, uh, you know, one could say he had no choice, but did he have no choice to throw that grenade that he did admit throwing that killed Private Spear. We that that does not fact that he admitted but it was in a has not been erased. Yeah, but if, 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 like it wasn't if, in a proper court of law, it wasn't an adversarial procedure with our norms and evidentiary. But the court has to like, rule. Listen, yeah. the court has to rule on that they have not done so. But if we could step back from that, I, I, it's true he he did admit to throwing the grenade. Um, I come back to the fact that uh, it was on a battlefield. Uh, usually, when we use the term terrorist, we're colloquially we're talking about people who blow up buses and restaurants and that sort of thing. Sergeant Spear, who was the victim, uh, it, was, it was obviously horrible that he died, but he died doing what he was trained to do. He died in a proper pitched firefight in Afghanistan. And it's not, and when people say, oh, he was a terrorist, yes, he was trained to be a terrorist, but it was actually a military engagement in which this took place. And I should also say, well, one of the most... Well, then a military tribunal technically should rule. If you're saying it's a military engagement, but then one should say, say the, that the, the rules, rules of, of military engagement should the apply. Rules of, the rules of due process at a military tribunal are not the same as you would see in a court here in Canada. And it's pretty clear that children were subject to special exemptions in those, those military tribunals. We have three lawyers here, so this, <laughs> this could uh, get very deep. But a, a lot of Canadians are... They, they don't get it. I mean, you even mm -hmm. tweeted today, John, that... You know, a lot of your journalist friends agree with you, but that regular people don't. Is the, is the government, uh, I'm sure you think they are, Tasha Supriya, do you, is the government a little bit out of touch on this question? I mean, like, I do think... you think he actually deserves it and that people can understand that. I think there's a very good reason why people are angry, and I don't fault people for being angry mm -hmm. ab about the situation, but the reality is, is that had previous liberal and conservative governments not failed Cotter's rights abroad, we wouldn't even be in the situation. And the fact is that the, the, the Harper government took this to court as long as they could, and even when the, the 2010 ruling did come out from the Supreme Court, they waited another two years to actually repatriate him. So, that, but yes, and that, there's no question. Yes, they waited that period of time. Um, is that the violation that is being found here by the Supreme Court. No, the Supreme Court said it was Canada's involvement in providing intelligence, sharing intelligence with the United States, and, and But beyond the legal argument, so, Tasha, do you, do you think that the government has misread Canadians? Absolutely. I and, think they, they don't understand. They don't understand, and like I said, especially because there are other cases out there, other situations where they have chosen to pursue cases at taxpayer expense. If I could just jump in, though, I, I, I think that 
the, uh, perhaps the Trudeau government underestimated how much people would object to this. But sometimes it is the responsibility of governments to do unpopular things Thank when you. it's mandated well, yes. by the Charter. I should also say two things that might explain the popular response. One, once you label someone a terrorist, it becomes this magic designation that says you are beyond the rules of due process and you can just do whatever you want with them. I reject that, but there are a lot of people who don't, and they say, oh, Qatar's a terrorist, so, you know, throw the book at them, it doesn't matter. The other thing is there's this cynical talking point you often see on Twitter that, well, this is a slap in the face to the memory of Sergeant Spear. I don't buy that either. You could mourn Sergeant Spear, but at the same time say Sergeant Spear was killed by someone who was programmed to kill as a child, and he was mistreated in part thanks you know, to our government. We try children as adults in certain cases. We do. We don't simply ascribe absolutely no responsibility to But with an abundance children. of due process, which wasn't the case at the military tribunal. You, are, we you saw the video. John, we don't know. You weren't there. And I think that the fact that, um, in this case, that's the other piece, is the optics of it, is that Sergeant Spear, his widow, Tabitha Spear, um, at this point, has very. it's going to be very difficult for her, because the payout's been done, to access any of this money. And I think that is also part of it, is the sense that there has been a, a miscarriage of justice in that there was an application filed to get whatever compensation could be obtained, and this was then rushed through right after the payout was made, which pretty much almost preempted from getting it. through if this has been like a 10-year no, ordeal. No, because June 8th was when it was filed by Tabitha Spears' lawyers. What do you think, you're, so, you follow uh, communications and yeah. how they'll ha handle it in Ottawa, what do you think of the way that this was handled? I mean, the Terribly. Prime Minister was out of the country, mm -hmm. we still don't know the details but we of don't what know the, the apology said. But they've have paid out other people whose rights have, have been violated, and we don't know the details of this, we don't know the details of any of these Deals but they didn't that commit go any down. Crimes. Mahar so, Arar, who's been cited here, there are as also an three other men just as early as, as March, I, I, I believe, who, who have been paid out. The, the general secrecy around these deals is, is, is dense, and I agree, they're not necessarily completely equivalent situations. Mm -hmm. But I think ultimately, when you have a government that is standing up to do the right thing in the face of, you know, outrage, I think that, as John pointed out, they do have a responsibility. The responsibility isn't to feelings and how we feel about things. The responsibility is to the Canadian Charter of Rights. I and also freedom. sense that the exact same people who are objecting, saying there's not enough information, if they were provided with all the information, the exact same people would object just because they don't want to see somebody who's been labeled a terrorist get money. There will be get people who have that response. I completely agree with you. But people like I said, Mahar Arar was labeled a terrorist. He was in prison for a year. It turns out he did nothing wrong. There we can say his rights were violated, compensation was provided. Is there an equivalency here? No. Stephen Truscott uh, you know, was alleged to have committed a crime, it was a criminal, wore that for 48 years. He got six and a half million dollars for his 10 years in jail. Uh, is well, the release of no. this in the middle of the summer with the Prime Minister out of the country, uh, you, one could suspect that the Liberals are hoping this will blow over. Yeah, it will blow over. Will it's, it? It's, it's a comms win, I think, for them, ultimately. Mm. I, I it's think, a huge I, issue for I, Conservatives. I, 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 I don't think it will blow over at all. For Conservatives, but the House is no longer thing. Yeah, people two years from now, when they go to vote, aren't going to be thinking about the Cotter payment. They're going to be thinking how the economy is, how their house prices are doing, I, I and if their kids are going to be in the moment, but I'm not a comms expert. <laughs> As I think my, uh, you know, I've demonstrated in the past. <laughs> However, I would say that uh, Cutter's name will be used as a dog whistle. It will. Yes. It will be yeah. used as a dog whistle to say Trudeau is soft on terrorism and he's going to let guys like this into the country. Oh, I, I, we I, are I, out of time. I'm sorry. I, I know disagree. that we could go on yeah. with this. It's been <laughs> quite a political week for yes. a hot day in July. Thank you so much and uh, we'll see you soon. Coming up, my conversation with a Canadian who's lampooned more than his share of prime ministers. People think I hate Mulroney. It's not true at all. Political cartoonist Terry Mosher, a.k.a. Aislinn, next on The National.
summer is golden. The CBC Sports app, 500 plus hours of live competition. Download the CBC Sports app. There was a time when political cartoonists served a role now largely filled by late night comedians. Before Stephen Colbert, Trevor Noah, and Rick Mercer, it was a sharp-eyed satirist with a pen who skewered politicians. In this country, there aren't many sharper than Terry Mosher, a.k.a. Aislin. He's won praise and scorn for mocking Canada's elite for decades. Earlier this year, I caught up with Aislin in Montreal. And in the age of Trudeau navigating Trump, we thought it fitting to share that conversation again. Canada may have the reputation of being boring and beautiful. But our history may be more sex, drugs and rock and roll than many think. Few storytellers have stirred up as much controversy or had as much fun covering our country as cartoonist Terry Mosher, a.k.a. Aislinn. So I've got a kind of a nervous looking Paul Martin. <laughs> He lampoons every politician, every moment we've loved or hated over the past 50 years. From the arrival of separatists, to Trudeau mania round one, to our religious fervor over hockey. His drawings have skewered just about everyone. It's so easy to poke fun at these people when they sort of, they pretend to have all the answers. Oh shit, hello, you know. <laughs> These days, everything is fair game, but not so 50 years ago. The Queen was off limits until Aislinn crossed that line. He details it all in his new book, From Trudeau to Trudeau, 50 Years of Cartooning. I met up with Terry Mosher, Aislinn, at the McCord Museum in Montreal, where an exhibit is celebrating his life's work. So 50 years of cartooning, mostly Montreal based. How much has the country changed? How much has Quebec changed? You've, so much of this is about Quebec yeah, and Canada? Yeah, I, I, I got to cartoon in the heyday of all of those wonderful referendum years and PQ years and that sort of thing. It's quietening down here. There's no question about it. Is that a There's, good thing? Well, maybe <laughs> not for me so much, but it's a good thing, I think, for uh, people finally realizing that, uh, that Quebec is a a pretty good place and it's run pretty much by Quebecers now and so there's not that old anger that say the Jacques Perezos and the Bernard Landry's had about the English. It's changed and younger people are kind of fed up with this. They'd rather be on the internet. Noticed a few of your cartoons about the, the relationship between the, the French and the English and mm -hmm. one from many years ago was uh, English dogs sp oh, speak French. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, the subtle complexities of the political situation here in Quebec. Very subtle, yeah. I, I, yeah. And the, the graffiti says, speak French, English dogs. Those were the days when that, that sort of thing happened. Another one after the last or referendum, the second referendum, which was the Francophone and the Anglophone sort of speaking to each other, saying, That's, bonjour Sylvie. Yeah. That was a cartoon that was called for. If you remember, the second referendum had been very intense, and it was very close, the, the final vote. And I just felt that it ha I had to draw a cartoon, not of the winner or not of the loser, but of two ordinary people, neighbors. Out on their balconies. Balconies. Yeah. And one is taking down her we signs, and the other, the fellow is taking down his no signs, and he's looking up and he says, how have you been, Sylvie? And she's saying, bonjour, Frank. In other words, we come out of it, and we go back to being ourselves again. Because I think people outside of Quebec don't understand how one side could try and take the province away, and yet people still somehow manage to get along. Well, we do manage to get along. It's primarily because of hockey. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, no matter your political persuasion, uh, everybody uh, is a hockey fan here. And that, that kind of, it's one of those things that pulls us together. Like a religion. Yes, yeah, and I started that with a cartoon about indicating that uh, that the new religion in Quebec was uh, was hockey. The other cartoon that you did was very famous. It was uh, René Lévesque saying, "Okay, everyone, take a Valium." Yeah, actually, that was after the PQ was elected in 1976. Okay. 
uh, I drew this, I walked into the editorial offices at the Gazette, and all the writers had these white faces because the results were coming in. There was clearly going to be a major PQ victory. And how simply it happened was all these jerks could use a volume. And I went back to my drawing board and drew Ronald back point. Okay, everybody take a volume. And uh, there was an immediate reaction, particularly in the English community, about that, like, okay, yeah, it's not the end of the world. And I'm ha happy to say, yeah, a lot of Anglos left, but more of us stayed, and we took our volume, and we're better Montrealers for it. You gave Levesque a volume at some point. I did, I did. It was, it was so funny. I won a national newspaper award one year, and he was, he was a guest in Toronto. And as a joke at the party before the national newspaper awards, I said, Monsieur Levesque, j'ai un cadeau. I have a gift for you. Okay, you know the way it was. Ooh. So I handed him a 10, a 10 milligram value, which is a pretty powerful thing. And Levesque, God bless him, looked at it. And he had his scotch, and he took it. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody kind of, whoa. And his speech died halfway through. He began <laughs> slurring and this, that, and the other. I and I laughing. take full credit for that. By the way, uh, at one point, we were pretty good friends. So... So, and he was a good sport about it up until the end. He was, he was, uh, he enjoyed the cartoons. Yeah, I can sort of tell, looking at the cartoons, which people you liked. I think, yeah, <laughs> I think that's, pr you can't, you can't help. I mean, I, my Stephen Harper cartoons are not remarkable, I don't think. I, I never met, he's the, I think he's the only prime minister I never met. So, there was no enthusiasm about that guy. And I don't know if I'd walk around the corner to meet him, quite honestly. Mulroney, you had... Oh. You would now, certainly people, enjoyed drawing him. People think I hate Mulroney. It's not true at all. I enjoyed watching him so much. And he was from Montreal, and we all knew him. And the, the Irish bluster and very pleased with himself. Sure they steal your heart away. He was really paranoid about what people wrote about himself. He was sort of a... Uh, he's terribly insecure about that. So it began to really become very easy for me in cartoons to begin to point out oddities. His but then chin. His chin. Well, you know, the old expression was, it's not that his chin was so big, he had no neck. <laughs> not true. So uh, early on, one of my favorite cartoons, he was boasting about what the cartoonist did with his chin. He was really pleased with that. So I put it in a brassiere. <laughs> <laughs> How do you react to that? Uh, I d apparently not very well. Or it was Mila who was, was a little upset about that one. But you can't care about that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. When you were starting out, you uh, pushed the limits for a while. Yeah. What, what was taboo? Uh, uh, the royal family. There was a huge blow up about my royal family cartoons in the 1970s. Well, there was one with the Queen with Prince Philip on... On her knee, yeah. And like nobody had ever drawn a, even a, a critical cartoon of the Queen in the English language media up until that point. Really? Ever? So the, the, in, ever. Uh, it was just, f it was forbidden. So the Monarchist League went nuts about that one. Well, and I noticed her feet. Yeah, there were sort of su bigger suggestions in her little feet, which you just play around with. <laughs> so you were asking it's for trouble. That that's what we do. <laughs> <laughs> you were asking for it. Uh, in a way, yeah, in a way. And then a few years ago, 2008, the Obamas uh, visited uh, Buckingham Palace. I think it was their first official sort of visit. And Michelle Obama wasn't all that familiar with protocol, right? And she tall Michelle Obama. She, she touched the queen, right? <laughs> and her hand was strategically located. <laughs> so I drew this <laughs> with Michelle Obama saying, who knew? <laughs> <laughs> Not one letter of complaint. Really? Yeah. So, so things change uh, in terms of public acceptance of things. So, in 1967, Pierre Trudeau was starting his yeah. political career. Now you've got another one. What do you think of the two of them? How do they how do they compare? I. Uh, all right. The two Trudeaus. It's. Not as if they're, they're Tweedledum and Tweedledee. It's not that at all. But they're both very, very smart and clever people. I don't think people realized how smart and clever Justin Trudeau was. They were all, even these columnists, uh, Andrew Coyne and people were dismissing him as an airhead. And they were wrong, you know? I mean, he really put that, that election is going to go down in the history books. 
And I remember my favorite cartoon, and I think his favorite cartoon, was just before the election, it's Justin peering out saying, we're leading by a hair. <laughs> <laughs> and that was it, exactly. I mean, and then they just... So he's, uh, he's rapidly, despite all of the, the selfies and stuff, he's rapidly developed a lot more respect amongst the populace, I think, in Canada. And he's his own man. You portray him often shirtless. Well, he often appears shirtless. I mean, you go with what you've got, Wendy. You have to, right? And he, uh, yeah, actually, uh, my first drawing of Justin Trudeau was him uh, driving in his father's car to Ottawa. But then the Sunny Ways thing came along. So I took the cartoon and I added a sun thing. And then he started to go around shirtless, so I took his shirt off. So it's interesting how this cartoon has evolved through different, different phases. So I notice you, you have an Order of Canada. They had an extra one hanging around. Well, you were denounced in the House of Commons this, what years a great, ago. What a great country, huh? <laughs> yeah, it actually exactly 10 years before I got the Order of Canada. I was denounced in the House of Commons by the Tories for a cartoon I had drawn of Brian Mulroney. Much outrage and, you know, indignancy and that sort of thing. And then 10 years later, I got the Order of Canada. And uh, great country. It's been a real pleasure. Thanks, Wendy. Yeah. Nice to talk to you. Yeah, thank you. Okay. We've talked to a lot of interesting people on Sunday nights this year. You can check out those interviews and a lot more on our YouTube channel. Just go to youtube.com slash cbcthenational. You can subscribe and let us know what you think. Coming up, a Canadian World Championship win that's not hockey. Plus... A music festival takes a unique approach to fight drug overdoses. That's next on The National. Suicide is a huge problem here in this town, we lost so many friends. My best friend, Johnny, committed suicide. During his funeral at the church, I didn't cry. Not until he was getting put down six feet down for the last time I was going to see him. into million pieces.
Before I was just a quiet guy, shy guy, but now I'm not shy anymore because I want people to be more happier. With a rising number of opioid deaths across the country, a Winnipeg music festival is taking a new approach to drug use, arming first aid crews with kits in case anyone overdoses. Katie Nicholson reports. With its mellow, family-friendly demographic, it's not the most likely venue for hard drug use. But the Winnipeg Folk Festival isn't taking any chances. Hello. It's first aid staff all trained to administer naloxone, just in case anyone overdoses on opioids. Patrick Boreski didn't need any training. The festival volunteer is also a medical resident. So I've seen firsthand the, uh, the opioid crisis and fentanyl, which has popped up in the news a lot. And you don't need to be a doctor to use the kits. It's that easy to use that we can trust anyone to, to be able to handle these kits and administer them. So I think it, it just makes sense, uh, especially at a festival where there, there is the potential for overdoses. It seems like such a natural thing to have on hand. Festival organizers say there hasn't been a drug overdose here in 10 years. Still... It's not necessarily a need, but uh, much like having a fire extinguisher in the home, you hope you never have a fire, but you like having a fire extinguisher. The Winnipeg Folk Festival says it is one of the first in Canada to be ready to deal with opioid overdoses. They've also distributed cards to help volunteers recognize the signs of an overdose. The more information in our back pocket, the better. Festival goers say organizers have created a safe environment. There's lots of volunteers and stuff like that and too and they so always come and do checkups yeah. on you and they always come and make sure that everyone's doing fine and stuff like that. I do know if anything happened I would be safe. The festival says it hasn't had to use any of the naloxone kits yet. People, it seems, are content just to get their fix of folk. Katie Nicholson, CBC News, Winnipeg. There was a huge basketball win for Canada today. The Canadian men's team won the World Under-19 Basketball Championship, beating Italy 79-60. Before today, a Canadian basketball team has never won a FIBA World Championship at any level, making it Canada's first ever world basketball title. Another Canadian first hosting the World Indigenous Nations Games. The closing ceremony and Parade of Nations capped the nine-day event south of Edmonton. More than 1,500 athletes came to Canada from 29 countries. When we come back, we'll have more on the BC wildfires. Under the instruction of the Bank of Canada, two Ottawa firms do most of the processing of currency. Two years ago, it was decided to bring out Canadian Elizabethan dollars. The product of the work that began then will be seen this week when the new bills come into use. Oh, just get some out open here and give to the tellers. The new bills look a little strange at first. A more mature Queen Elizabeth is on the front. Robins claim territory on the back. The bills are more detailed, more colorful. The bold numbers make it easier for visually impaired people to use. But visually, they don't appeal to everyone. I don't like them. Exactly. That's why should we change? Canada's new $1 coins came tumbling off the mint's money presses today, and some people are already calling them loonies. They're made of nickel, copper, and recycled old tin cans. They're gold-colored, and they have 11 sides. Last fall, a courier service lost the original design of a voyageur, so it was switched to a loon swimming on a lake. It's coming, the latest addition to Canada's coin collection. Here's a sample token of the new bimetal coin, nickel on the outside with an aluminum bronze center. 
Now all they have to figure out is what design to put in the middle. There's no shortage of ideas. At the Canadian Mint, there are 19,000 of them. This design embodies the strength and the determination of Canadians from coast to coast. The new bills are smooth, almost slick, with clear windows. And they won't tear easily. I told you. There's a great future, the Bank of Canada says, in bills that feel like plastic. These new banknotes are a 21st century achievement in which all Canadians can take pride and in which all Canadians can place their confidence. When the banks open this week, you'll find the latest symbol of Canada's age of development, the new Canadian dollar. Before we leave you tonight, we wanted to recap our top story, the wildfires in B.C. Here are some striking images and reaction from those affected. We could see all the smoke all the way from, from the fire in William's Lake. Me and my brother-in-law were watching it come over the hill. Went out in my patio and the fire was on the mountainside right behind my house. The police called and everybody got to go and I went, oh. I don't want to go anywhere. I don't have anywhere to go. All of a sudden, it just pops out of the trees, and then they're like, you got to leave, you got to leave now. They wouldn't even let us get our goats out of the yard or the chickens. It's got to be 15 new fires in the last couple of days. When you think about it, it's pretty tough. I thought I was going to be lost in the middle of nowhere. I could, but now I got, you know, people and everybody's so supportive. I love this city for helping us. We're all loggers and we're planning on heading back down to try to help out. That's The National for this Sunday night. For news at any hour, you can always go to our website, cbcnews.ca. I'm Wendy Mesley. Thanks for watching.